Last week we, or last time I should say, we finished uh, chapter 7, which is a very long chapter. And uh, we're going to begin chapter 8 tonight. Probably we'll finish it. But chapter 7 is the story of Stephen um, being brought before the council uh, of the Sanhedrin, which was a judicial uh, branch that Rome tolerated for the Jewish people, where you just kind of police your people, especially when it comes to religious matters. And so he was being brought before the council um, uh, and, and accused of preaching things that were contrary to the word of God and blaspheming, uh, you know, Abraham and Moses and so on and so forth. And then and, 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 um, uh, that particular chapter, he begins as he's asked, are these accusations true? And when he was asked, he begins to deal with the history of Israel and showing them how the prophets throughout the ages were, were criticized and, and, and rejected and even uh, you know, persecuted. And, and some of them were even killed or you know, murdered, if you if, if please. And anyways, so Stephen preaches this message and he says, and then he talks about Jesus being the prophet and you guys just killed him. Now this did not go over very well. And uh, the religious people especially were very upset. And so uh, it says that we, they were so upset when he accused them of this Jesus who had just been crucified. And now he's saying he's the son of God and he is your king. And uh, you, you murdered him. And, uh, and th- then uh, they really get upset. They, it says they gnashed upon him with their teeth. They were very, very upset. And as they begin to come against him, he begins to see a, the heaven opened. And as the heavens open, he sees this Jesus that they crucified. They see him standing to the right of, of their God, their father, you know, the father. And when he said, oh, I'm, I, I see him right now. I see heaven open. And that really sent them over the edge. So then they run him out of town and they stone him. And while he was being stoned, they put their clothes down there, and, and this man by the name, young man by the name of Saul of Tarsus uh, was holding their clothes for them while they were doing the stoning. And so that, that finishes, and let me just read at verse 58 through 60 out of Acts 7. He says, And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on, the, on God and saying, Lord, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he died. Wow. And as I've said before when we taught this last time, had he not done this, I don't believe Saul would have ever become the Apostle Paul. You know, Jesus taught that you can retain sin or remit or forgive sin. And so many times as Christians, especially if we've been really wronged, we have a tendency to retain sin. And it doesn't do a a thing for us. But not only does it not do a thing for us, it really hampers the, the, the spiritual life of the person who sinned against you. And we should want them to get free. Here's a man who was being stoned, mistreated horrifically, and, you know, he's being stoned. And then it says, he, and he's calling on the Lord while he's being stoned to receive his spirit. He knows he's about to graduate. And the last act that he does, he kneels down while he's being stoned. And he says, Father, I want you to take and, and, and do not hold this sin against him. I release them from the sin. Don't even charge it to their account. And so now we, we go into chapter 8. If we go, go there now chapter 8 and it says now Saul was consenting to his death at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and so what was happening here is not only did Stephen get stoned but a lot of the religious people react, reacted well to this, and so the religious leaders were trying to get more feathers in their caps, so they began to go out and, and seek others who were radical, these people who were radical, and going to make a public example of them. And we see 
often throughout the scriptures where, where they were hauled into court and, and, and judged for, for preaching, uh, especially if they taught in the name of Jesus. Because that is the, you know, the, the name that put them on the spot as we are the ones that crucified this, this man and, and caused his death. And so uh, the church is being persecuted. Sometimes we look at these things and say, oh, you know, this, these evil people are winning. You have to understand that God is always in control. When I look at what's going on in our nation and throughout the world, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a maddening. I mean, you know, Job said that in the last days, I will take reason from your leaders. We're there. I mean, we're there. I mean, it doesn't even make sense what they're doing. And we need to understand that when all this stuff is happening, even though it's unfair, God is in complete control. And so why would God let the early church who's now, I mean, the praise and worship going on in the church at Jerusalem is phenomenal. People are getting saved daily. Miracles are happening everywhere. And God then kind of puts the fire out, it looks like. He allows them to be persecuted. But God had a bigger, uh, you know, goal in mind when he allowed the persecution to come to the church. Because how many people know when you're content and everything around you is a blessing, you, you don't want to move anywhere? But it says here, uh, it says in verse 1, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles stayed there. But the people were scattered. Why? They ran because they were not appreciated in town any longer. They were being persecuted. They were being punished for things they didn't do. And so now they take off. But God had a plan in all that, didn't he? Let's look at um, verse 2. And devout men, uh, how did I get back? Yeah, there we go. Yes. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made a great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women committing them to prison. Now, if that were happening to born-again Christians in this city, uh, that's going to be a real challenge now, isn't it? They're hauling you off to FEMA camps or whatever. And so, you know, people start getting out of Dodge, especially if they, they pick a city. And so long as that city, people would think about moving out, wouldn't they? Especially if you're a Christian. And if you don't admit it, someone else will tell on you. So anyways, they're, they're being scattered, but God had a purpose in scattering them. And look at verse, uh, verse 4. Therefore, he says, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Now, you know, they enjoyed the services at Jerusalem. There was things happening. God was moving. The presence of God was thick. And they were enjoying church, and God gave a great commission he says, go you out into all the world and preach the gospel. But they're not, gonna go, they're not going out because they're so, so blessed to be in this church, and they're not moving because they don't want to uh, miss a meeting. So God moves them out using pressure. And as they go out, they're declaring the word of God and preaching the gospel to every, every creature in, in all these cities. It says and then verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and preach Christ unto them. And multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So God is taking the, you know, what was going on in Jerusalem. He's starting to move it out and, and, and create a bigger area that's being touched by the goodness of God. We sang about the goodness of God tonight. Sometimes we have a tendency to hoard it to ourselves and just huddle up and just want this to, to last as long as possible, but God wants us to take it to the world, to the four corners of the earth. He wants the world to be, you know, changed by what's changing us. But the tendency is to get comfortable, get blessed, and want to stay there and huddle up and keep doing it and doing it and doing it and experiencing it and experiencing the, the, the goodness of God. But I believe God is still has that great commission uh, as, as a charge for us today. No matter how blessed your life is, you need to learn to get out of your comfort zone. God wants, to, he wants this world. That's his goal. And he promised his son the nations as an inheritance. 
And so we need to understand that's what's, what's happening. So he says, all these people were hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, they weren't going to this church, but they're taking the church out to the world, and now these people are beginning to be touched by the same thing that touched these people who have been scattered. And he says, so they, they begin he, they hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Great joy in the city. So the persecution caused the scattering of the church. Leaving their comfort zones, they begin to preach wherever they go, giving a reason of their hope, and people start getting saved outside of Jerusalem. And this is what God is wanting them to do. And... Um, you know, we, we look at this, what's, what's happening here in Samaria. Did you ever wonder why Samaria, another, you have to understand who Samaria is. They were the ten tribes of Israel that, that, that didn't follow the Lord. You know, Judah, you know, the, the, you know they, they stayed close to the Lord. But these people were, uh, they were considered as half-breeds. And so they weren't acceptable. And even uh, people will say, why did he go to Samaria? And why did this really work so good? I believe there was a seed that was planted in Samaria earlier. You remember what that seed was? The woman at the well. Let's take a look at John chapter 4. Jesus, you know the story of the woman at the well. You know, give me some water. And she said, you, you know, he says, why are you asking me? I'm a woman, first of all, and I'm a Samaritan. You Jews don't talk to Samaritans. He says, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. You don't have anything to get the water with. It's, this well's deep. He says, well, that, my water's not coming from that well. I, I have water. If you ever drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. So he, he piques her interest, and she finally says, okay, I, I, I'll have a drink. He says, but before I give you the drink, you need to go get your husband. Well, I don't have a husband, sir. You're right. You had five, and the one you're living with is not your husband. Well, she perceives she has a prophet in her midst. And so she's going to ask him a question that is a controversial question that Jews and Samaritans argued over for years as far as where is the house of God on the earth. The Jews say it's Mount Zion. The, the, the Samaritans said it's Mount Gerizim. And so she's going to get this answer because she's got a man from God here, and he says, well, at least the Jews know what they're, they're worshiping. You're clueless. And then she didn't like his answer. He says, but the day's coming when you don't worship at either mountain. It'll, it'll, you'll worship in spirit and truth. And God's looking for people who will worship him in spirit and truth. And so she says, well, you know, when, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all these things, and we'll get the answer then. He says, woman, look at me. I that speak to you am he. That's all he said. The Holy Spirit must have done something because she takes off and, and goes to, to, to Samaria and tells the people about, come see a man who told me everything about my life. And so we're reading about this in, 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 in John chapter 4. So in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. And she's already evangelizing. She believes he is the Christ. So Jesus sows a seed into that city, she goes in, and these men come out. Now, obviously, the men knew her very well. And uh, she had, f had uh, five husbands, and she was living with a man who was not her husband. And so it says, and they went out of the city. And then going on in um, uh, verse uh, 39, let's go to verse 39. <clears throat> and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. 
So she's given away what she received. She had a revelation of who Jesus was, and she didn't waste any time letting other people know. She didn't hoard it to herself. She went out without persecution. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believe because of his word, not hers. So now we see seed being sown, and now more seed is being sown. Then uh, they, 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 you know, they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Wow. I really believe that Samaria was, was being reaped of some sowing that took place before. And we don't know, it's, we think it's been several years that they were content to stay in Jerusalem until God made it so uncomfortable that they, they took off and uh, were running for their lives and preaching the gospel everywhere. Coming back now to uh, Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> now, you know, I believe, you know, what was done in Samaria... It was, it was the seeds were planted, and now they're growing, they're sprouting. I believe there was an atmosphere for Philip, who was going to come now to Samaria and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, back in Acts chapter 8 now, verse 9. But there was a certain, no, is that verse 9? Yeah, verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is a, a great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ... Both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles, the signs which were done. It's amazing what happens when, when the atmosphere is right and the word of God is preached that even the powers of darkness and the ministers who minister for the kingdom of darkness are, are affected. And here's a, here's a man who was a champion for the kingdom of darkness, now becoming a believer. Wow, that's, that's, that's something. And, um, and so we go on here, and it says um, in verse uh, 14, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had not fallen off. It had fallen on none of them. They only had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's interesting uh, that the apostles, uh, you know, uh, come down to bring order to what was happening with the evangelistic ministry. So there's fruit. Now they're wanting to bring some order to the church. And, and so one of the things they do, they start talking about baptism. Now, you know, one of the basic foundational truths of of the doctrine of Christ in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. There are six of them. Anybody tell me what they are? We should all be able to say it in unison, right? The doctrine of, what's the first one? Repentance from dead works. Second one? Faith toward God. Third one? Doctrine of baptisms, plural. Laying on of hands. Resurrection of the dead. And eternal judgment. Good. So, they're dealing with some of the basics. They're talking about baptism. What baptism do you have? The baptism in the name of Jesus, which is water baptism. And then he lays hands on them, and they begin to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we, we see what this atmosphere did. So this sowing that Jesus did at this, at this well one day, this is the reaping of those seeds. And I believe that's why a revival broke out in the area of Samaria. And so 
Uh, but it's interesting. I, I like the fact that here's a, a champion for the kingdom of darkness that's affected by the gospel. And I believe, again, it's because of the atmosphere of God, the glory of God was in that place. Amen? And then, um, uh, so the apostles begin to lay hands on, on the, the people who were, were saved, and they begin to receive the Holy Spirit. And um, this, uh, Simon uh, responds. And it's going on in, in verse 18. Let's look at verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So obviously, when people receive the Holy Spirit, there is some type of physical evidence. Some of these people say, Well, no, no, we believe that when you get born again, you're automatically baptized in the Holy Spirit. Give me a verse for that one. And why would he, if, you know, receive the Holy Spirit, receive the Holy Spirit. Nothing happens. And he says, I want money to do that. He wanted money because something was happening that was supernatural. And so when they laid hands on these people, they received the Holy Spirit. Obviously, it was some type of manifestation that could be seen by all. And we believe the initial evidence of of, of uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues or prophesying. And so Simon now wants to be able, and you've got to understand, he's accustomed to divination and being able to tell people, read their mail and, and, and give them prophecies um, and uh, t- tell their future and so on and so forth. And I, I believe he charged the money for that. And, they, and people gave him money. And so now he sees that I, I can use this now to continue my livelihood. And so here's, here's uh, you know, what Peter says to him. Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. He responds very, very sharply. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if he perhaps, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now, wait a second. How do the apostles know this? How does Peter know this? Anybody have a venture guess? Word of knowledge. Word of knowledge. And then he gives them a word of wisdom. He says, you need to uh, pray God if perhaps he might give you repentance, basically what he's saying here. And so we, we see he's dealing with, and, and I don't see how you would come up with bitterness except you got that supernaturally. You, uh, you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Remember, iniquity is, is to be perverted or bent. It's like warped lumber. And it's more than just a sin. It, it's the thing that keeps producing the sin, your warped nature. So when Jesus comes into the heart of a person, I believe that many times he takes away the, the, the thing that held you in bondage all your life, held you into the world. He doesn't take away everything, but he takes away the things that really kept you from coming to him. Point, uh, you know, uh, being made is in, in the exodus out of Egypt. What kept the people in Egypt? The Egyptians. But what, once they started on, on their journey, what kept them from getting to the promised land? There was a big sea in front of them. So God, and, and, and there were soldiers from Egypt chasing them. So he splits the sea, brings it back together on the ones that chased him. He says, see these bodies floating here? They'll never bother you again. The enemy that held you in bondage, I've taken care of it for you. But did that mean that Israel was all spiritual now? I don't think so. They showed plenty of areas for growth uh, shortly after that. And, uh, and so we need to understand that sometimes when, we, when a person gets saved, it, they can generally get saved and though, uh, some things are taken out of your life. There are things that are there, left there, that God doesn't deal with when you get born again. And you have to understand why, because God is going to use them to bring you to a place of maturity. It is a 
gradual thing. It is a progressive thing. It's not an instant thing where a person gets saved and all their, you know, their iniquities and all the, all the things that are in them that are their vices are, are gone. We have to overcome some things, don't we? That's part of how we get to maturity, by overcoming the things that, that come against us. And so here, here we are, and, and he says, uh, you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. There are things inside of you that, is, that are perverted, and it's causing you to still hold on to greed. I think it's amazing when Jesus was talking to the rich young ruler, when the, he was asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, what does the word say? And he says, well, keep, keep the law. And, 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 and he says, I've kept them from my youth up. And Jesus says, there's one thing lacking. Here's what you need to inherit eternal life. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Now, what kind of doctrine is that? If someone asks you, how do you get eternal life? You tell them, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Come to church. That is not sound doctrine. What he said is not sound doctrine, but it was sound doctrine because of the word of knowledge and wisdom that Jesus had. He knew the very thing that was holding this man back from receiving eternal life. The money had a hold of him. He was keeping all the other stuff. He was probably a model uh, religious person, but the thing that was holding him in bondage and the thing he, he needed to surrender to be free was his money. So you might read that doctrine as Jesus saying, you need to surrender the thing that's holding you back, the thing that you, that you hold on to and won't give up if you want to have eternal life. I think that's true of us today. We must learn to surrender the thing that holds us, the thing that, that grabs our heart and, and, and competes with, with uh, God's will and, and, and heart in, in our life. And so uh, he goes on in verse 24, look at this. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. I believe he was convicted. I personally believe this man who was a sorcerer is going to be in heaven. I believe what he did was wrong. It showed the greed and the bitterness and everything that was in his heart. But when he was challenged, he surrendered. He says, I need prayer. He didn't justify himself. And so he says, you just pray for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. Do you think Peter might have prayed for him? I do. And I think the prayer worked, and I think this man is, like I said, is going to be in heaven. Verse 25, so when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of, of, of the Samaritans. It's interesting, they come to bring order to that harvest that was brought in. The, the fruits gathered in, and now the apostles come to bring some order. They talk about foundational things, such as the baptism in the name of Jesus. They talk about uh, the Holy Spirit baptism. They begin to deal with sin and, and, you know, things in people's lives. They they operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And so they begin to do these things. And it says, and after they were done with what they were supposed to do, they head back to Jerusalem. And as they pass through villages, they're preaching the gospel. They're now evangelizing and, and reaching out and trying to bring others to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And then that's the apostles. But who started all this? Philip. Do you know that Philip was an evangelist? Uh, Let me just give you a scripture real quick for that. Acts, um, uh, let's see here, 21. Acts 21. Verse 8, we got it up there yet? On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist. Now, do you remember who Philip is? He was one of the seven deacons that were ordained in chapter 6. Remember, they were to be men full of faith, full of power, good report in the community. These weren't just, you know, handymen. They were spiritual beings, and they were part of of the government of God. That's what we believe about deacons. And that's why there's such a a high code of ethics, uh, you know, that was given by Paul to Timothy when you're setting them in. 
And, um, but anyways, look at, look at the life of Philip here. He was an evangelist. And it says then in verse 9, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So I think he was bringing up his, his home well. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. But Philip was an evangelist. And so going back to the, 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 the Acts chapter 8 again, uh, we wanted to, the, the, the apostles, they, they go back to Jerusalem and see what happens with Philip. He's leaving Samaria. Now it says, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Now, can, how did he do this? I mean, an angel of the Lord, Lord spoke to him. So, I mean, we're talking about gifts of the Spirit operational here. And so he, he speaks to Philip saying, arise, go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is not an impression. I mean, he's getting very distinct directions here. So I want you to take the road. I want you to go south and take the road that leads to Gaza, and, uh, and it goes through the desert. Now, if, if you know where he was, he was in Jerusalem. He's, 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 he's you know, Samaria. He's coming down through Jerusalem, going down the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he says, so he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who had uh, charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. So he comes to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning, verse 28, and sitting on his, in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So there's a, there's a communication going on here, and this is why we need to understand how important it is that we exercise our spiritual senses to discern both good and evil. When Peter came down to Samaria, did he perceive that this man had a wrong spirit? So we're, we are to see and discern both sides of the spiritual dimension. And so here's Philip, he's, he's hearing this, I want you to take this specific road. So he does. What am I supposed to do? He doesn't tell him what he's supposed to do. But then there's this person, a, uh, an Ethiopian eunuch, who's traveling back after some time of worship, going back to Ethiopia, and, and he tells him to overtake him. Right? And um, an anyways, how does he overtake him? He runs. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet. He says, you see that guy down there in the road that's traveling? Catch up with him. Well, Lord, when you transport me, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. No. He says, so he ran. This doesn't all have to be supernatural, people. What, the directions are from heaven, but sometimes he uses your body. And so he runs to him, heard him reading the, the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a, as a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before its shear is silent. Jesus didn't reply. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. Because he didn't defend himself, he did not get acquitted. Had he got acquitted, we'd still be in our sins. Sometimes you have to understand, it's not believing for the, all the good things. We need to understand what the plan of God is. And so he knew that he needed to, to die and suffer and die. So it says, in his humiliation, justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Who is he talking about here, himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began, beginning at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. And I believe he used the scriptures. And by the way, they didn't have an, a New Testament then. So he preached Jesus out of the Old Testament. Yeah? Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? 
So obviously he talked to him about Jesus, talked to him about the doctrine of baptisms already. And uh, then Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when he left Jerusalem, he didn't even know who Jesus was. Amen? Think about that. And so then he takes in the scripture that he's reading from and starts there and goes through the Old Testament scriptures and proves that this Jesus who died is, in fact, the, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. And so he makes a statement. I believe that he is the Christ, the anointed one, and he is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and, and, and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now, obviously, he's, he's not pouring water on him. They both went into the water. So, you know, and we're, of course, we know from our foundations classes that the word baptize is a, uh, you know, is a Greek word, baptizo, and it simply means to immerse into a substance. And then you begin to take on the characteristic of that substance. Water, you get wet. Holy Spirit, you, you, you get anointed, okay? So anyways, he says, now when they came out, out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Sometimes we read these things and we say, put yourself in, in that eunuch's place. Here he is talking to him. He just gets baptized, comes back up to, to, the, you know, to the, his ride, and all of a sudden, boom, where'd he go? He has no idea where he went, but they tell us in the word where he went. It says, but when Philip was found at Azotus, <laughs> now that's, that's interesting, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I believe he was caught up, transported to Azotus, and Azotus is a city near the Mediterranean coast. We're talking about 37 miles to go from Jerusalem to the Mediterranean coast. So here's Philip, had to run to overtake him to, give it, to, to minister, but after he was done ministering, God wanted him somewhere else quickly. I remind you of the, of the night that Jesus was up on the mountain praying and his, and his disciples, in obedience to his command, were going on the other side of the sea. So they were rowing across the sea. In the middle of the night, they've been rowing for hours. A storm, a tempest is there. They're, they're, they're spending all this time, and they're only, they're only halfway across. When Jesus sees them on a dark mountain, he sees them miles away in the sea, and he sees that they're, they're, they're struggling to, to, to get there. So he goes walking to them on the water. God says, go to your disciples. He goes. There's no boat in the water, uh, on, at the shore, so he walks. That was the first time. And so he's walking, and, and then and finally, you know, the story, that they think they're seeing a, a ghost. And uh, they, they believe in both sides of the spiritual dimension for sure. And so finally he gets in the boat. And l- what a lot of people fail to, to read is that immediately the boat finished the other half of the trip immediately. Now, wait a second. There's a boat with 13 people in it, and so, just like that. They spent half the night getting this far, and the other half got just like that. We look at these things and don't realize these are things that Jesus experienced, and we should not rule these out for ourselves. Philip was a man. He put on his pants one leg at a time just like you do. You know, he wasn't a superhero, and and. Uh, he wasn't even an elder. My goodness, that's not, that should be illegal. <clears throat> and I mean, he gets transported just like that. He vanishes in thin, you know, thin air. And so it says, but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And so, you know, we just need to realize that if we want what the, what the, you know, many times we used to sing that song years ago, we, give me that old-time religion. Pfft, I don't want the old-time religion because what, what the new-time religion is going to be better than the old-time, so why would you want that? And these things happen to ordinary people. You know, Elijah was a man just like you, and he prayed and didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and it did rain. But you know the, the struggles he went through during that time, even to get it started raining again, after three and a half years, you're pretty accustomed to not raining. And so it took faith. And we need to understand, if we begin to apply faith and, uh, 
give ourselves to the Great Commission, anything can happen. I believe if the, the glory of the latter church is going to surpass the glory of the former church, what we're reading in Acts will pale in light of what Acts 29 is going to be. And by the way, chapter 29 is you and I doing what they, they demonstrated in chapters 1 through 28. And we need to begin to lift our eyes a little bit higher and, and our expectations a little bit higher than, than we've had them. The church will be more glorious in the last days. And I believe there's a lot of good things in store for us. We need to start changing how we think. There is nothing impossible for God. And he will use just little old you if you make yourself available. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for uh, the promise that you've given us, uh, that you want to use us. Lord, you said that you're going to make a church ready. Uh, You're not coming to make the church ready. You're coming for a church who is ready. And so, Lord, we believe that the glory of this, this house will uh, exceed and surpass the glory of the, the uh, early church in Jerusalem. And, Lord, we, we are excited about the potential that is there. Lord, may we not, uh, not uh, set our expectations lower than what you set them. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you're about to do. We believe that we are in these last days, and we believe that you're going to bring it to pass even in our lifetime. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.